They say it takes a village to raise a child because children need a lot of different people to look out for them. Families can use all the help they can get. After all, no parent is perfect. That's why McCoy leads the Early Intervention and Prevention Initiative. We want to showcase all of the excellent programs in our city that help families learn and grow together. Because when we learn and grow together, we make our village a better place to live. Thank you for tuning in. We hope you enjoy this episode of Our Kids, Our Families, Our Communities. Hello and welcome to Our Kids, Our Families, Our Communities. I'm Mitzi Wilson. I'm the Early Intervention and Prevention Initiatives Director at the Marion County Commission on Youth. And this show is focused on providing vital resources for families in the Indianapolis Marion County community to improve outcomes for, for youth. Um, today, we have as guest uh, Laura Henderson with Growing Places Indy and Danielle Patterson with the American Heart Association. So to kind of get moving on our topic, I would first like to just kind of have a moment for each of you to introduce yourself. So to begin with Laura. Thank you, Mitzi. I'm delighted to be here this morning. Um, I'm the founder of a small nonprofit called Growing Places Indy, and our mission is to empower people to cultivate personal, family, and community wellness. We're doing that through the avenues of urban agriculture here in Indianapolis, access to fresh local foods, and mind body education. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And Danielle? Yes, good morning. Good morning, Mitzi and Laura. Uh, my name is Danielle Patterson. I'm the Government Relations Director for the American Heart Association. You know, um, our goal is to build healthier lives free of cardiovascular and de diseases and stroke. And we do this through fundraising, advocacy, quality improvement, uh, systems changes, um, and we're just trying to reduce uh, the burden of cardiovascular disease and stroke uh, in Indiana and throughout the nation. Thank you. And Laura, can you tell us a little bit more about Growing Places? I know that this is a project of yours that you started on your own, I believe, back in 2008. So why did you start Growing Places? Yeah, actually in 2008 we started the Indy Winter Farmers okay. Market which led to Growing Places. Um, I was working with a friend, Matthew Josie, who's an urban farmer here in Indianapolis, and was given the opportunity to start a garden in White River State Park, which we still have there today, the Slow Food Garden in White River State Park. And it was really an opportunity to just start to connect people to food and where it comes from, and the fact that um, lots of fruits and vegetables can grow in Indiana, mm -hmm. Uh, and we could be growing more fruits and vegetables in Indiana. We're one of the largest agricultural states in the nation and yet import almost 90% of our food supply. So there's a disconnect there. And um, we just wanted to start bringing attention to this kind of conversation. And from there, as we talked to people, we really started to learn how much people were, were to, to use kind of a pun, hungry for a connection to food and access to fresh local food that really felt nourishing um, for them and their families and a community in which to understand what it means to eat well, um, how to use fresh fruits and vegetables because it's kind of a lost art mm -hmm. of, of cooking um, for lots of reasons and um, so it's been really a process of discovering what the community is looking for, what the needs are, and what are some of the small ways that we can step in and start to uh, provide for those needs. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And something that you know Laura mentioned was really that conversation around access. And as much as we can talk about having healthy foods, um, you know we can talk and talk, but if families don't have access to those foods, then there's still a disconnect. Mm -hmm. um, and so Danielle, I know that um, the American Heart Association has been in that conversation around food access. Can you say more about that? Yes. The one thing that we know, uh, the correlation between you know, uh, getting people healthy, uh, helping their recovery from uh, a cardiovascular event, or even preventing one is nutrition. Um, and you know, using our organization and our brand to really fight for uh, laws um, and uh, ordinances that will help improve uh, nutrition standards in communities. And one of the things that we're working on is healthy food financing. And what healthy food financing is it helps to provide the financing so that grocers 
or, you know, farmers markets, farm stands, you know, uh, urban gardens, mobile markets could get the financing to move into an area where people lack access to healthy foods. So you hear the term food deserts mm -hmm. uh, more often, uh, where people have to travel more than five to 10 miles to get access to healthy food. Well, we're trying to set up the, a public-private partnership where, you know, people who do not have access to credit or can't get the financing can actually get it through a program uh, to open up a grocery store or, again, a farm stands, farmer's market, uh, a co-op um, in an area that's designated as a food desert. And they will receive a grant or a loan from a program that will help them in, in, in that regard. Or, you know, you can look at an existing uh, grocery store and they can expand so that they can offer more fresh fruits, vegetables, dairies, and uh, meat products. Uh, but as a condition, 30% of their floor space or more or more will have to be designated for fresh fruits and vegetables, meat and dairy. Yeah, you know, Danielle mentioned food uh, deserts. Mm -hmm. There's the the other side, but often in the, in the same areas are food swamps, where the food that's available is by and large fast food, convenience food. It's not health promoting, exactly. certainly not heart health promoting no. <laughs> uh, food, and so. You know, part of the disconnect between eating healthy and food access is also creating a palate for healthy foods, for foods that are really going to nurture and nourish. And so part of what we're doing in our education programs and with the mind-body education is stepping back even, even another step mm -hmm. to develop that interest in eating fresh fruits and vegetables so that it's something that people want to do, um, not just something they're being told they should do because mm -hmm. you know I know I like to do what I want to do right. not necessarily what I know I should, should be do. doing or mm -hmm. someone told me I mm -hmm. should be doing um, and I can tell you now having an 18 month old daughter like already she's got strong opinions about what she eats and if she doesn't <laughs> want it it's not going down so how do we start to cultivate with our kids and with the adults in households who are making the food buying decisions the the palate for fresh food because it tastes different That's true. than convenience food and fast food. Mm -hmm. And so kind of re, you could say re-educating our taste buds, but it's really just re-stimulating our mm -hmm. taste buds. It's more about that, the mind going, oh wow, this is really great and I feel really good when I eat this. Mm -hmm. Then people crave more and it makes that education side a lot easier. And that's one of the things that we are building into the legislation. It's not that, you know, we're, we're trying to build these facilities and people not come. You build it and they will come. But it's also educating the community, making sure that there's dollars available so that, you know, we can host cooking classes mm -hmm. and educational mm -hmm. sessions so people really understand, you know, healthy food is better than the processed foods. But we do have children that, you know, they don't get it unless they're in school and you know we worked hard to change the school meals but now we have to change what's actually served at home because you know what's served in the home really guides your your thinking mm -hmm. your culture your behavior so we have to change all of that uh, and we know that fast food is so much easier for people you're like oh I could just drive through McDonald's and I could get this and I could you know go home no, it's not good for your children, though. Mm -hmm. And that's the one thing we have to educate parents on. It's just not good. And you both have kind of touched on, you know, kind of two key points around, um, you know, perceptions about, you know, healthy eating and healthy food. Um, so what would you say to that person that says, you know, I can't, you know, afford um, healthy food. It, it costs more. It's just too expensive. Well, that is the problem. Um, in some areas where there is limited access, mm -hmm. you know, it's expensive. Mm -hmm. um, you go to a local, you know, you have some drug stores that sell some fruit, some uh, healthy products, but you're looking at a dollar for a banana or an apple. Mm -hmm. Well, it is hard to do make that decision to purchase one banana for a dollar versus, you know, you could probably get several boxes. Right, two for one, you know, <laughs> bags of chips or, you know, 
four boxes of, you know, mac and cheese, mac and cheese <laughs> or, you know, some type of processed food. So when you're looking at families that are on a limited budget, of course, they're going to make the wrong decisions because this is what they can afford. So somehow we, we have it wrong in this country. Mm -hmm. We make the processed food so much cheaper than the fresh foods. But we have to figure out a way to bring more places like growing Indian local urban farms into the food system so that we could put more food out there so we could lower the price and people could eat healthier. Yeah. We're, we're in this question of um, the affordability of fresh local food a lot because we are we run urban farms and we are looking to employ farmers and right. give people a start in farming and in order to make that a viable livelihood for mm -hmm. someone we have to be able to pay a fair price on that food mm -hmm. and so it's finding a way to both lift up those in our community who quite frankly they just are not paid enough for the work that they're doing we we need to be looking at issues beyond food and health and issues of jobs and wage and you know all of these things that that create um, the disparities in our mm -hmm. communities and in the meantime not paying our farmers less because we don't want farmers who are also without food right. <laughs> which is the irony in a lot of rural <laughs> yeah. areas food that's, insecurity that's yeah food, in, food insecurity is as much sometimes a larger problem in rural areas than in urban areas um, again, because largely what we're growing is not food. Uh, but to bring it back to our cities and our communities here, there are programs that are helping to bridge that um, affordability gap at mm -hmm. this point in time. So we, the Growing Places Indy runs the Indy Winter Farmers Market. And one thing that we've done is um, in addition to accepting SNAP benefits, so someone right. can choose to come and use their supplemental nutrition assistance mm -hmm. program benefits at the farmer's market, well, that's all well and good. But again, when you're comparing you know, what they can get for $5 at the farmer's market to what they can get for $5 at the convenience store, exactly. we need to make it more appealing at the farmer's mm -hmm. market. Right. So there's a, um, we started our own internal program called the Eat Well Initiative okay. that will match SNAP benefits up to $20 a week at the farmer's market. And, and those dollars can be used on any SNAP eligible product at the market. A couple of years ago, the Indy Food Council and the Indy Hunger Network and a group of folks here got together and pushed forward an initiative called Fresh Bucks, which provides another match at farmer's markets in Indianapolis for fresh fruits and vegetables. So we actually have both programs at the Indy Winter Farmer's Market, which means somebody can bring $20 of SNAP or less right. and have it matched up to $20 from both Eat Well and Fresh Bucks in the same week. Wow. And they can do that every week. So that really, right. we, we see that as a strong incentive um, for choosing to buy those fresh products uh, which include vegetables, dairy, meat. Even though it's the winter, we've got vegetables every single mm -hmm. week of the market right. um, over the convenience food products. And we have cooking demonstrations and recipes to help people make use of those products that they can get at the farmer's market. Exactly. And those sound like tremendous benefits. Yeah. Well, if you're looking at a family that's struggling, uh, if they get SNAP, you know, that's $40 that they could take advantage of to get you know, fresh fruits and vegetables. And so, you know, it's just a matter of educating people to go out there, take the time. Yeah. Uh, you take the time to go to McDonald's, take the time to go to a farmer's market and see what they have to offer. And the summer markets, there are a number of summers, summer markets that also accept the fresh bucks, including the farmer's market on Market Street outside of City Market in the summer. So there are lots of options. And I will just say that farmer's markets, I don't think are the be all end all solution, right? Because mm -hmm. they're open, you know, any given market's open one day a week for somewhere between three and four hours. Right. And if you're working during those hours, or um, I even know for myself, it becomes challenging just if nap time is during those hours or, you know, whatever, you're juggling various family members, obligations and needs, it can be hard to get mm -hmm. to the farmer's market. And so it is a piece of putting the puzzle together, mm -hmm. but it's not the only piece by any yeah. means. Um, at our farm stand in the summer at the Bonner Fitness and Learning Center, we have a U-Pick okay. where um, people can come and it reduces the cost of produce. We also subsidize 
the price, like we keep the prices really low. So all the produce is under $2. Again, that's three hours a week, one day a week. It's a piece of the puzzle, it's not a full solution. It sounds like you guys are working more on some bigger solutions. Well, and that's one of the reasons why we ele elevated the conversation beyond grocery stores. I mean, people say, well, we need a grocery store, but that's, th that's not as easy um, to implement. You know, mm -hmm. grocery stores, grocery owners want to make money. They want to make a profit. We have to understand that. And if there was a profit to be made in that community, they will already be there. We get it. So we have to offer other community solutions where, you know, again, uh, community gardens, gardens, co-ops, um, you know, what about not-for-profits that are serving the need? Mm -hmm. You know, can they establish a relationship with the grocery store to bring, you know, fresh fruits and vegetables to an area where people really don't have transportation? Mm -hmm. um, you know, mobile markets. Mm -hmm. um, we have to elevate the conversation beyond, you know, our brick-and-mortar grocery stores. And that's one of the things that we're doing with the legislation. So kind of outside of the grocery store, especially for youth, um, a place where youth are accessing food are through their schools. Um, so can you say more kind of just about the, you know, the benefits and the um, different food access programs that happen through the schools, um, specifically um, around, I'm kind of losing my, the National School Lunch Program. Sure. <laughs> so, you know, for once, uh, I'm happy to talk about this, one of the first pieces of legislation mm -hmm. I worked on. Back in 2006, Indiana, for once, we were ahead of the curve on this. We were the second state that passed better nutritional choices in schools, where, you know, we changed what was served during the lunchtime uh, for snacks, you know, breakfast. We eliminated what was served in vending machines in terms of elementary school kids did not have access to soft drinks and, you know, had more milk and juice and things of that nature. So for once, we were not the 49th or 50th state to do something. But, you know, the, the trend changed nationally. And so when you look at uh, now, uh, there is a greater focus on what is served in schools because we know that kids it may be their only meals that they get. Mm -hmm. And that's for breakfast, you know, for lunch, and after school, you know, snacks. You know, they get a morning snack as well. Mm -hmm. So we have to look at what we're serving kids because if they're getting unhealthy meals in schools and unhealthy meals at home, then we're not helping kids. And you know, our child obesity rates is going up. And so we had to change all of that. And it became a national conversation. You know, how do we improve uh, school lunches so that kids had, you know, nutritious breakfast, uh, 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 breakfast meals, lunch, you know, the snacks, and now there's even a push to change what is served for fundraisers. Why are mm -hmm. kids selling right. candy, yeah. you know, <laughs> instead of apples and oranges? Um, you know, what's served at the uh, games? Mm -hmm. Now, I know <laughs> yeah. we all like a hot dog and, a, <laughs> you know, a slice of pizza, but, you know, again, if kids are getting all of these unhealthy meals, we have to change the conversation. Mm -hmm. um, and even for celebrations, instead of teachers giving a kid, you know, mm -hmm. a candy bar, you know, why not an apple or an orange? Mm -hmm. or, and stop giving out coupons to get, you know, some type of fast food treat. We have to change that whole conversation. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I explained it to like this with lawmakers. I said, you teach kids how to do math properly. And one lawmaker said, yes. I said, well, then in health class, you teach them, you know, about nutrition. And he said, well, yes. I said, but you serve them unhealthy items. And he thought about it. No one made that connection. Yeah. We should be teaching kids the right mm -hmm. things to do, give them the right messages, throughout the entire day. And that's one of the reasons why that conversation changed. And again, after school, um, when kids are not in school, you have a lot of uh, programs that provide groceries for kids okay. to take home You know, on the weekend. Have, they have summer feeding programs because the schools are the central place where kids more than likely will get nutritious meals. Yeah. There's a great um, small nonprofit in town, the Patichu Foundation, that's doing healthy meals after school. Um, so there, there are a lot more organizations starting to look at this. You know, and I'll, I think that it's common in our community, not just our community, but at large, for people to say, well, my kids are healthy or my kids aren't overweight. Right. Why should I be concerned about this? And it's, it's our, it is all of our concern because 
our community is only as strong and resilient as vibrant and vibrant as the people who live in it and that's mm -hmm. every person who lives in it and we know there are studies that show how vital proper nutritional input is mm -hmm. to not only our physical development but our mental and emotional mm -hmm. development That's and right. even our social emotional development. Mm -hmm. And if we don't have that at a young age, then the result is kids that have more difficulty paying attention in school, kids that are slow, you know, development is slowed, kids that are more aggressive and have more violent tendencies because of what they're eating. And so mm -hmm. this isn't to shame anyone. Right. You know, we're all doing the best we can with what we've got. It's to say, it's not just about your kids, it's about all of our kids. Mm -hmm. Because if our kids aren't doing well, our community is not doing well. Mm -hmm. And so it's our responsibility to take a look at what can we do to make sure that everybody's getting the nutritional input they need to develop their bodies and their minds and their emotional capacity um, so that we have really mm -hmm. healthy, strong community. Well, and, and then to go even further, we, we see so many kids nowadays that have adult-like symptoms, mm -hmm. you know, high blood pressure, you know, type 2 diabetes. Um, and these are kids that are developing these issues early. Well, when they get into their 20s and 30s, you know, they're going to be severely sick if we don't do anything mm -hmm. about that. So, you know, even mm -hmm. for taxpayers, we have to be mindful about that because then that becomes a burden to us. Mm -hmm. um, more than likely, they're not going to be able to sustain jobs if they're, you know, have a chronic disease um, in 20s and 30s. Mm -hmm. And so we have to address the problem now. It's based, even looking at our workforce, you know, people working in the future, you don't want them to come into the workforce with high health care costs. Mm -hmm where you're already paying for a chronic disease and someone is in their 20s. Yeah. That's, you know, we have mm -hmm. to think about the future, the future of our state and improving our health across the board. Yeah. And that prevention piece is kind of a huge aspect of the focus of the American Heart Association. As you know, you can reach adults, but if you can get the children um, and really kind of build that, um, the mindset around healthy eating and healthy living, um, you know, that serves you trifold, so. Well, if we want to significantly reduce mm -hmm. chronic disease, cardiovascular mm -hmm. disease across the board, we can't wait until someone That's turns right. 40 and start mm -hmm. educating them about their heart health. We have to start, you know, at early ages. Um, we were focused on kids, but now we're even looking at the early child care okay. setting. You know, what messages can we incorporate when they go to daycare? Um, because again, you have daycares that, you know, kids just sit and look at TV all day and they're feeding them, you know, unhealthy meals. Well, that's a condition. You're, you're conditioning children for this type of behavior. Mm -hmm. So how do we even change the rules where kids are moving more? You know, they're exercising mm -hmm. in daycares. They're, you know, looking at nutritional standards to make sure that kids are getting healthy meals. We have to start as early as possible. Even with, you know, pregnant moms, again, yeah. just mm -hmm. educating them on, you have to change your behaviors. You know, stop smoking, you, know, you have to eat right. You have to exercise, even for you to have a healthy baby. And then we have to start, once that baby is born, until, you know, they become an adult, reinforcing those messages mm -hmm. so that, you know, they don't end up being overweight like me at 40. I mean, I'm serious. <laughs> it's something that you have to constantly work on and mm -hmm. exercise and change your diet. We have to start that early. We can't wait until later. I'm, I'm yeah. being honest. Mm -hmm. And there's some great examples here in Indiana. There was a local food summit a few okay. weeks ago at Ivy Tech, Ivy Tech um, hosted. And I attended the farm to school portion of, of the summit. And um, there is, I cannot, I want to say it's Fort Wayne or South Bend, I wish I could remember, where they are working through the preschool, um, in-home and, you know, institutional preschool programs to make sure that everyone can have some sort of garden, even if it's a container garden, okay. so that they're getting kids active and starting to learn about food and introducing healthier foods. Um, so I think that's really exciting, and mm -hmm. it'd be great to see that happening you know, more broadly. I know there's more of it happening than we even know about, but right. we need to continue to elevate those stories mm -hmm. um, to continue to build interest and celebrate what we're doing well, because it can get kind of doom and gloom when, yeah. when we always talk about 
what's going wrong. Mm -hmm. um, so there is a strong farm to school network as well in Indiana. And if you, if people are interested in more information, the Indiana Department of Education has a great farm to school page. Okay. Um, the coordinator for that is Mag Maggie Shabel. And um, there are just a number of school districts and townships that are really working on bringing more fresh food into the school meals and, and building the state economy mm -hmm. by doing that working with um, Indiana farmers. Piazza Produce has set up a whole line and they have a K through 12 specialist who, yeah, is I working with yeah. schools, a school liaison. Um, she's actually a former Growing Places ND summer apprentice, okay. Rachel Miller. So we're proud that she's gone on to do this work <laughs> oh, with wow. Piazza. Um, and so she's working with schools to help them in that uh, procurement from from Indiana and regional growers. Um, there's a woman named Becky Landis in the Manchester County Schools in North Manchester, Indiana, who's done a lot to directly connect the farmers in that area to get the food in the schools. And schools are doing a lot more to highlight particular vegetables mm -hmm. and get everybody to, to try them and try different recipes that they can take home and share with their parents. So there are a lot of good steps um, underway and we mm -hmm. just need to keep taking exactly. those steps. It's like we need like a Fitbit for our, right. <laughs> <laughs> for our yeah. healthy food <laughs> access steps so that we can all celebrate and see our progress and see, you know, okay, we need to keep going. We need more right. steps in today. Right. I smiled because that was a piece of legislation we offered farm to school, um, but due to some other issues in the state house, the bill didn't pass, mm. but the Department of Education said, we're still gonna implement this. It's a great program, so I'm just so happy to hear mm. that it's taken off. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that we do, we do sponsor gardens in schools too, from the American Heart Association. Through some of our sponsors, we've been able to uh, plant gardens in uh, schools across Indianapolis and the state. Uh, it's just such a great program because you're starting to educate kids at an early age about, like you said, you know, growing good, local, fresh, nutritious food. Yeah. And you both have really been just a wonderful resource of information for us today. Um, so before we close the show, though, I want to make sure that our viewers have a, a means to access you. Um, so if you could just share um, the website, both for Growing Places Indy as well as for the American Heart Association. Yeah, we're Growing Places Indy. It's I-N-D-Y dot org. And we're also on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. And also the IndieWinterFarmersMarket.org yes. is the Winter Farmers Market website. So our national website is www.heart.org. But if people want to learn more about the Healthy Food Access Campaign, we're under the Indiana uh, Healthy Food Access Coalition uh, that was convened by the American Heart Association. We have a Facebook page and Twitter. So people could just look up Indiana Healthy Food Access. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. And I did just want to state that if there are any families that are having um, difficulty accessing food or needing to get access to food pantries or other services, um, that they can contact 211 for Connect to Help, and they will help them reach those services in the Indianapolis community. Um, so um, to close, I just want to thank our guests, both Laura and Danielle. You have been very informative today. Um, and that really closes our show on food access. So I thank you for watching. Thank you. Thanks.